Good morning, good morning. Greetings in the name and grace and peace of Jesus, our resurrected Christ. Good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Kyle Reynolds. I'm the senior pastor here at St. Paul's. We're so grateful to have you worshiping with us. Uh, we are a community that uh, tries to love God and all others unconditionally, to seek answers to our questions, and to serve God by serving others. Uh, thanks for being a part of worship this morning. As we get started, uh, several announcements for you. First of all, if you would take a moment to register your attendance sometime during the service, we would be grateful. There are green notebooks on the end of your row. Uh, you can uh, fill out your attendance there. Let us know that you're here. You can also find a place uh, to share a prayer request. So if there's a way that we can be in prayer for you in the, uh, in the week to come, we would love to do so. Uh, feel free to fill that out. Uh, drop that in the offering plate when that comes by a little bit later in the service. Um, I feel like I just have to start by saying how wonderful last week was. Um, and a huge thank you. Um, to our 40th anniversary team and uh, to all the folks who helped make that day possible. Uh, that was a blast. I am still sort of in the, uh, I think, the afterglow of that. So thank you um, for, for all of that. Um, coming up, some things to look forward to. So we have a Trunk or Treat on Saturday, October 26th. That is here. Um, now is a great time if you would like to host a trunk. Uh, to let Alice know that. Um, it's also a great time to invite a friend or neighbor to come and be a part of that. Uh, we're just about three weeks away from that and hope you'll be here. Uh, that's always a, a good time. We have moved it from our usual, or from the last couple of times, Sunday to Saturday. And so um, that's a little different for us, but uh, we hope it's an opportunity to invite people onto our campus to share in uh, something that will be fun for the community. Um, this upcoming Saturday is Pride in the Park. Um, uh, the, uh, I don't know the date, this Saturday. Uh, 10, I believe that's 10 to 1. Um, if you would like to help us table there, um, part of what we'll hear in the sermon is that uh, it is good uh, that we are a church that uh, embraces and includes and, and seeks to continue to be inclusive. And so um, we would love for you to be a presence at Pride in the Park along with us uh, again, you can see Alice if you're interested in being out there. We would love to, to have you show up for a little time or for the whole time. Um, or you can chat about it at the Love Team meeting on Tuesday evening. So that's an opportunity as well. Next week um, is Intergenerational Sunday School. That happens during the Love Seek Serve Hour immediately after this service. So you'll be invited to head straight downstairs after worship next week. That is actually being led by our youth council, which is great. Uh, this is our second in, a, uh, in this uh, uh, try of, uh, of creating intergenerational dialogue. And so uh, the first one was great. I hope you'll come and be a part of that. Again, that's next week during the Love Seek Serve Hour. Yesterday, we had some folks at the Hike for Reconciliation, for Reconciliation Services. Uh, always a good experience there. Um, St. Paul's in the Park is a small group uh, that I am leading. We started on Friday uh, at 1 p.m., and we will continue each Friday at 1 p.m. at Shawnee Mission Park. Um, you can reach out to me. It's sort of a roaming small group uh, to find out where we're meeting or uh, we're getting the newsletter out in the morning, and the information will be there. So you can just put it on your calendar um, and know that you're headed to Shawnee Mission Park, and we'll get you the details on Friday. Um, today, uh, we are taking a special offering for uh, hurricane response for UMCOR. You'll hear about that a little bit later in the service. Today, we are celebrating World Communion Sunday. You'll hear a little bit more about that later in the service. Today, we are also kicking off our sermon series, Forward by Faith, in which we are imagining our collective future together. It is an opportunity for all of us to consider uh, what it is that makes us generous and how it is that we're called together to support the ministry that God is doing through this place. So I am excited for that journey. I'm grateful that each one of you is here. Um, and I want to invite you just to stand and let's begin worship. <laughs>
exaltation and I was born to lift your name above all names you hear the melody of all creation but there's a song of praise that only I can bring who else is worthy who else is worthy no one, only you, Jesus. Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no one, only you, Jesus. You are the infinite God of out this morning, Lamb of God, Anointed One. Lamb of God, Anointed One, who was and is and is to come, seated on the throne above, Holy, Holy, Righteous One, who shed His blood, you proved to us the Father's love, Jesus Christ. to invite you to join in a time of prayer. Holy God, today we remember that Jesus prayed that we might be one. One in spirit 
one in mission, in union and communion with each other and with you. Today, God, we confess fumblings and failures in accomplishing unity. And we set aside yet another, as we set aside yet another day to remind ourselves of this task. On this World Communion Sunday, give us eyes to recognize your reflection in the eyes of Christians everywhere and all that we need. Give us minds to accept and celebrate our differences. Give us a heart big enough to love your children everywhere, and we know that we are all your children. God, thank you for setting a table with space enough for each of us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm Pastor Eric. I'm so glad to be with you all this morning. Uh, as we prepare to take our offering, um, each week we like to highlight uh, an area of ministry uh, where we see God at work uh, and get to, to prayerfully give our gifts to extend that work. Um, so many great things happening around the life of the church. What a celebration it was last week um, to get to see all the things our, our church is doing uh, today, uh, on this World Communion Sunday, I'm really thankful for our connection, our connection with other churches. And one of the ways that it comes to bear uh, is through our ability to do disaster relief uh, quickly and on the ground. And so we're going to take an offering this morning for um, recovery and relief after Hurricane Helene, uh, which, uh, as you know, has devastated parts of Florida and Georgia and South Carolina, and particularly uh, Eastern Tennessee and Western North Carolina. And I, I have a lot of friends in Western North Carolina, and so um, I wanted to just read a, a firsthand account um, from my friend Lauren. She says, we, are, we were unable to contact the outside world, which meant our families and friends had not heard from us in almost 36 hours. As we assumed they were seeing news about just how bad it was, we worried about their worry. We left our information with anyone who had even a whisper of a satellite phone or connectivity. Call this number. Tell them John, Lauren, and the kids are okay. Again and again. Hope someone sends the text, makes the call. Keep checking obsessively if we have any bars. Do it again, even though you just did it. Repeat in an hour. Tell the next person. And that night, we made dinner on our camp stove and strategized for the next day. How will we get the word out? Was it worth it to try to ride to another town? We saw military helicopters flying low over the valley. Should we have the kids pack go bags in case they were, we'd be airlifted? Would asking them to do that terrify them? We had enough water, but gas for the generator was lower than we wanted. Then when its low thrum sputtered to silence while we were eating, we looked at each other nervously. As we sat around the fire pit that night, we wished the clouds would clear so we could see the stars. Um, and she goes on to talk about how in these moments of crisis and disaster, uh, it's so devastating, so difficult, particularly the, the trauma for kids and families, just so much disruption. This is like right outside their house. Um, but uh, uh, also, she celebrated the ways that people come together um, to uh, offer hope and offer help in these times. And I'm so grateful we can do that through our connection. United Methodist Committee on Relief um, is already on the ground, and we can give to that, and the cool thing about it is that the overhead costs are paid by uh, other ways that our church um, supports the work, and so 100% um, of what you give for this offering, and you can also do that online, um, goes directly to the, the hurricane relief. And so we're going to give um, to to be the kind of church that's connected in that way uh, when we hear the the needs of the world. And uh, if you'd like to specifically give for hurricane relief, you can write that on a check, or like I said, give it online. At this time, our our ushers will come forward and uh, take the offering. Also at this time, um, our children, you guys, we're so thankful we're connected to you, and uh, we want to hear about what you're learning. And so if, if you'd like, uh, you can go uh, with Mr. Gary to uh, Kids Connection at this time downstairs, and we will see you guys in a little bit for communion. We especially want to have communion with you guys all the time, but especially on First Sundays.
you to stand and we're going to sing our doxology together. Oh, bless the gifts our hands have brought and bless the work our hearts have planned. Ours is the faith, the will, the thought. The rest, O oh God, is in your hand. Good and holy God, we give you thanks for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon each one of us. We give you thanks for the enduring promise that your spirit continues to move among us in so many ways. Make us a people who are grateful. Make us a people who are generous. Make us a people who see needs around the world and find the ways that we can respond to them and step out in faith, trusting that uh, in caring for our uh, siblings, in all sorts of places, we're following as you would lead. Bless the offering that's been received. Bless those who will receive it. Take it and multiply it. That many, many may experience your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Friends, as we continue in worship, I want to invite you to take a few moments to greet one another. Uh, if you don't know somebody, it's okay to tell them your name and ask them theirs. Our friends, our scripture reading today comes from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. As we work together, we urge all of you not to accept the grace of God in vain. For God says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacles in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, in honor and, di and in dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, excuse me, to you Corinthians, our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak to you as children. Open your hearts also. May God add blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. So the, the one phrase that I want us to think about most especially today from that scripture reading is owning nothing and yet possessing everything. That is where we'll turn our attention. So Rob Bell uh, tells a story, a couple of stories actually, to illustrate the difference between owning and possessing. He owns a, an original painting by Jeff Condon, 
and he put it there on his wall, and he says that uh, the first time a, a particular friend came over, she walks in and says, oh my goodness, that's a Jeff Condon painting. And then she begins to speak about the piece. She says, notice the framing and the colors and how the energy of the photo flows in a particular direction. Uh, notice the juxtaposition and how the subject, though they are two rooms away, seems to be moving because there is this flow towards them, but they are still. And she goes on and on and on, and when she finally stops, Belle says, you know, I hadn't quite noticed that myself. I just sort of thought of it as a painting. He gives a second example uh, about a specialty guitar that he owns. Now, he calls himself a, a hack musician who makes up for what he lacks in skill with volume. And uh, uh, he has this friend, though, that comes over. And every time he comes over, he'll pick up this guitar. And he says he can evoke a sound out of that guitar that Bell himself simply cannot. And he can play it for hours and hours and hours. So there is this difference between ownership and possession. In both instances, he and his family are the ones who own the thing, and yet their friends are the ones who are able to take and to possess it, to take hold of it, to speak of its worth and its value and its significance. So you can own something without possessing it, or you can possess something without owning it. So I wonder if you've ever known somebody in your life who, who perhaps owns very little and yet has this, this ability, this capacity to possess very much, who, who seems to be uh, more aware than many are of, of what's around them and, and what's within them and, and who's in front of them of what's going on, who seem to, to be tapped into a deeper level of understanding than sometimes we are. I've got some friends like that, and, and I uh, greatly admire those attributes in them. But I also wonder how many of us find ourselves too often on the other side of that equation. We, we own much, but we possess little. And if we're not careful, we become the product of the things that we accumulate. We can own them, and yet they can even possess us. We, we can do this as we build for ourselves our, our own little enclaves around us. So we do this with things for certain. We do that with possessions, with things that we can purchase and, and physical, tangible things that we can own. But we do it in other ways. Uh, one, one such way is with our time. Uh, this is not an original uh, thought, but I could not track down the author this week uh, as much as I tried. There's a writer who talks about our inability to be present in a given moment. And they, something, they say something like this, of course we don't own our now. We've already mortgaged the present in the past. In our ongoing cycle of overfunctioning, we're continually borrowing against the future in the present. And the past has left us with little ability to be here right now. But in the terms of Paul's writing in 2 Corinthians, we too often cannot even possess the present moment because of the past. There are so many things that we own, but we do not possess our resources, our skills, our influence, uh, sometimes our voices, sometimes our relationships, sometimes our own power. We could go on and on and on in so many ways. We live our lives as the antithesis of what Paul writes about today. So I want to unpack that a little bit. In verse 1 of our reading, Paul implores the Corinthians, do not accept the grace of God in vain. Uh, now this reading in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians comes uh, right as Paul is sort of building this explanation uh, about God's grace. And in the previous chapter, he talked about the grace of God through Christ, which makes us a new creation in this, this beautiful image that, that each one of us is invited to embrace. And and so now as we move into this chapter, he's continuing and he's saying that grace that has already been bestowed upon you, don't accept it in vain. And for Paul, uh, that means, uh, think of this like a gift, um, uh, but not a gift for another time and another place, uh, for somebody else or for something different, uh, but instead take, take ownership and possession, receive that gift and don't leave it on the shelf. He says, look, now is the acceptable time Look, now is the day of salvation. In other words, for Paul to accept this gift of grace in vain is to assume that it's for a different time, a different place, or a different purpose. It's to, to fail to be aware, to embrace the gift in the here and now. In other words, salvation isn't a far-off reality promised on the other side of death. Instead, it's something to be embraced and lived out of right now. 
That's what acceptance is about, as Paul talks about in that first verse. Acceptance means awareness and embracing of reality, and that's what Paul is imploring his listeners to do. So Paul continues then to talk about what this looks like in his life. It means full commitment to the calling of Christ, which in in his particular way of being and his particular calling has led to many challenging and great outcomes. Now, this is a part of a broader argument in which Paul is giving a defense of himself to the Corinthians, some of whom have sort of grown cold to him. And what he's saying is that in the midst of, of accolades and in the midst of abuse, I have stayed true to the calling of God. In other words, I have put uh, the grace of God as my animating force, come what may. And that's why he lists all these things, these persecutions and these accolades that he receives. He says, in the midst of it, we have remained true to what we were called to do. And then he wraps up by saying this, we are treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and yet look we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. And this morning, friends, I want to suggest that in many ways, we live our lives almost the exact opposite of that. So it might sound something like this, we are validated, and yet we act as those without power. We are well-connected, and yet overwhelmingly isolated. We are alive and well, but we feel like we're dying inside. We're given every advantage, but we speak as those who are under attack. We have much to rejoice over, and yet we rarely do. We are rich, but imagine ourselves poor. We have so much and yet we possess so, so little. Are you tracking? We get reinforced with these images all the time of what we don't have, with products that claim to be the the, the ticket to our contentment and status symbols that that say they will define our worth, with, with hacks that promise to bring us happiness and maybe a little extra time in our day. We're told that, if we, uh, that, that whatever we have and whatever we've done and whoever we are and whatever we've amassed and whatever we've accumulated, none of it is enough. And all of that, friends, is a scarcity mindset that we so frequently fall into the snare of. And, and we hear it from uh, beyond us, folks. Many of us also have these, these sort of tapes playing on repeat within us. There are narratives that, that say that we haven't quite got or been or done enough, that we aren't quite good or holy or smart original enough, and the rub is that when we're constantly feeling like we're always having to press forward, if we're only ever taken in our minds about the next thing or what's incomplete or still to be done, then we never can truly be present, and now we can never truly possess the moment, the the current reality. We can never embrace things as they currently are. And so we do this in all kinds of ways. We've, We've talked about possessions. We've talked about time we could talk about many sorts of realities of this, but, but I think there is no place that we do this, um, we fall shorter in this than, than sort of uh, owning or possessing our stories. We have these rich stories that we live in as individuals, as communities, as the church, as a culture. They're gold mines for finding the sort of things that make us who we are for better and for worse, and that enable us to make things better, more like the kingdom that God imagines. And, and when we possess the parts of our past in the present, it allows us to live into a more fulfilled and a more Christ-like future, a, a more of what God imagines for us, but we rarely do that. And so today, I wanted to take a few minutes to to sort of unpack three examples of of, of what this looks like, to to possess the the things that we have to possess, in this case, our stories. I want to unpack it uh, as a way of providing maybe a forum for how you might think about doing this in your own life, how we might do this together as a community, and, and how we might navigate this work as we move forward. So let's start with the history of St. Paul's that we've been celebrating over these last several weeks. I said it earlier, I'll say it again, uh, last weekend was incredible. The, the six weeks leading up to that were amazing. I have loved learning more about our history. But friends, I beg of you, don't let this, this season pass without finding a part of yourself in this story that we've celebrated. You don't have to have been here uh, for 40 years to recognize that you've benefited from a church Uh, that has made uh, certain decisions. So perhaps one of those is the investment in children and youth, financially and otherwise, to create space and programming for them. 
And you can recognize that, that that's something this church has done and that's something that you value and you want to uh, continue to support moving forward and recognize perhaps that maybe you're here because this church, church or some other church invested in their children and youth, which laid a foundation of faith. You don't have to have been here to own that part of our story, to possess it and to live out of it. You don't have to have been at St. Paul's for many years to recognize that this church has prioritized the environment. When we think about the land that we own and we think about the, the garden that is out there, the community garden, we think about the design of the building and the prayer stations and the ways that we've used our environment in various ways. And we know that this value is more important now than ever. Uh, the earth, as Paul says in Romans, is groaning for the people of God I would translate it for the people of God to start acting like the people of God who are called to steward the land and to care for it. And we can recognize that that's been a, a tradition in this church and continue to live out of that. You can find a part of your story in our story, and perhaps that's about welcoming all. You don't have to have been a part of the conversations around inclusion and reconciling ministries to recognize that you too are somewhere on a journey uh, towards affirming the worth and dignity and gifts of all people. All of us are on that journey. None of us have quite figured it out yet. And you don't have to have been a part of those conversations to affirm the need for communities of faith like ours to exist in the world to provide a different narrative of what it means to be the people of God. Finally, you don't have to have figured out your discipleship and checked all the boxes and be ready to preach on a moment's notice to recognize the work and the striving that goes to defining a pathway for people to grow closer to God and each other and make a difference in the world. That's work that's been done, and perhaps we can identify and find ourselves and possess that struggle and live into what it means to grow in faith. My point is, friends, that all of this is a part of our story. It's good and beautiful and strong parts of our story, story of God's faithfulness and, and our collective response. And you, whether you've been here for a couple of weeks or for uh, decades, uh, you are a part of that story, and that story is a part of you. And friends, we can't turn that off. We can't just decide not to own that, uh, that we want to mortgage that or sell that or give that away. The question is that while we own it, will we also possess it or will we pretend like it's not a part of us? The alternative is to recognize the ways that it shapes us and to move those pieces of, the story, of our story forward in faith and seasons to come. So I want to give a, a, a less uplifting example of what this might look like. To truly possess our story will also require us to, to grapple with challenging realities. It recognizes historical realities, and, and that's humbling because it often reminds us that we can uh, be complicit in the same sort of sins and transgressions and oppressions that our forebearers did. So for instance, Monday was National Day of Remembrance for U.S. Indian boarding schools. It's a day that commemorates more than 100 years of U.S. policy of removing Native American children from their homes, uh, relocating them to boarding schools that were often ab abusive and exploitive, and then stripping them of their cultures. And the U.S. government's primary partner in that work was the church. One of those schools was right here in our town. It was called the Shawnee Mission. And it was run by a man named Thomas Johnson, a la Johnson County. And Thomas Johnson's job was to be a Methodist pastor. So it's very much a part of our story, and we have to grapple with that. We have to be honest about that. We have to recognize that that continues to play, uh, those, those sort of themes continue to play manifest in our present reality. Johnson County continues to find unhealthy ways of, of sort of being an enclave, of defining itself by narratives of us versus them. We stated on record just a few weeks ago that we don't want unhoused people in our community because, as a couple of city council people said, it doesn't fit the character of our neighborhood. In other words, not in my backyard. We don't want to be made uncomfortable with people that we perceive to be different than us. Can't we just ship them back downtown? And here's the deal. Thomas Johnson benefited from exploitive labor practices, and many of us recognize that we have relative comfort in our life today because of ongoing exploitive labor practices around the world. What steps can we take to repair that breach? Boarding schools stripped ethnic groups of their particularity and culture, their beautiful God-given expressions of self and community. And can we be honest enough to say that sometimes we do the same when people find themselves in our midst? when we talk about immigrants and refugees and, and the ways that they speak and talk and act, 
with people whose gender identities we don't fully understand and don't fully bother to validate. We don't do the hard work of doing what they ask us to do. Can we recognize that these narratives continue on? Do we realize that we perpetuate these realities when we sweep them under the rug? That's what the United States has done largely in this case of boarding schools. That's really been the policy for most of the the last hundred years. That's why Native activists who organize this Day of Remembrance ask us to join in advocating for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. By the way, that's something this church is good at, right? At advocating. It's something you can do. There's already uh, legislation on the books. You can call your representatives and your senators and ask them to sign on. We can educate ourselves. That's something that we can do. We can recognize generational impacts and how they continue uh, to have impacts on communities because of deculturation and abuse and the defamilying that happened, not to mention uh, sort of the relocation and disease and limiting access to resources. We can recognize that all of those things are ongoing. And friends, this too is a part of our story. We own that, not because we chose it, because it's a legacy that we inherit. The question is whether we'll keep pretending things like this didn't happen and sweep them under the rug or whether we'll grapple with them, we'll possess them and figure out how to move forward differently than our past. Will we possess it and move forward or just pretend it didn't happen? I want to give one more example. Today is World Communion Sunday. And this is a beautiful celebration begun in the 1930s in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, It is an opportunity to remind ourselves of what is about us and what is about our congregation and what is even bigger than that. And that starts at the communion table. One of the lifelong invitations of the Christian faith is to grapple with the wonder and the mystery of this meal, of, of everyday bread and juice that becomes something different through this meal It is to be reminded that that when we encounter everyday food, we also encounter greater significance and meaning. It is to be reminded that God, who is beyond our comprehension uh, and our capacity and our imagination, comes to dwell and live among us, takes up flesh and bone, or as Eugene Peterson says, God moves into the neighborhood, that God is made knowable in Christ Jesus. And, And somehow we're asked to remember all of this each time we gather for communion. It's not just about the story what was, that was written. It's about the story that continues to be told. And, and we're a part of that writing. And our understanding of it, our place in it, in that grander narrative changes over time. So in the particularity of this day, we're reminded as we celebrate World Communion that we're connected with other people of faith around the world in the celebration of this mystery and in the telling of this story that continues to go on year after year, generation after generation. We're connected to others that that we will never meet or see from the uh, remote towns of Africa to the thriving cities of Asia to uh, people who are worshiping today in war-torn countries underneath tents to to megachurch cathedrals, somehow in the midst of all of our diversity and, and quite frankly, our divisiveness, there is this one symbol, this one great celebration that reminds us that we're all doing this work of finding ourselves in this broader story. That's what this day invites us to grapple with, to realize that our faith is not just about ourselves. It's not just about our congregation. It's not just about our denomination, but it's a story that we're helping to tell uh, with many people in many places through many generations. So to realize that for all of the unknowns and the beauties and the difficulties of the church, for the good things we get to be a part of, like mobilizing to respond uh, to hurricane victims and promoting worldwide health initiatives, all of those great things and all of the hard things, we uh, together get to possess this story and live out of its reality. So today we're beginning this season of generosity and we start here in this place talking about what it means to to possess and not, not simply what we own, but to take hold of that which we may never have rights to. And I want to start in this place, friends, because of this. Generosity begins with gratitude, and we know that gratitude begins with acceptance. We've already defined acceptance as awareness and embrace of reality, of what we have, of our time and potency and relationships and skills and resources and voice and stories. And friends, if we truly possess little as we are wont to do in our over-programmed, over-stressed culture, then we only have a little bit with which to be thankful. And if we were only thankful for a little bit, 
We might give some, but we can scarcely live as people who are generous. So my challenge for you this first week is to take some time taking stock of what you own and beginning to, to move towards possessing it. That might th be things that you have a title or deed for. That might be stories that you live out of. It may be uh, ways in which you invest your time. It might be the varied relationships that you have. But my hope is that we wouldn't merely be a product of our environment and the inertia of our past decisions, but that we would cultivate awareness and foster acceptance and shape our choices with intention, that we would build our future on the strong and worthwhile foundations of our past, trusting that God has more in mind than we could ask for or imagine. So maybe to do this, you want to start by thinking about the places where you've been tempted by the the, the narratives of lack, of scarcity? Where do you sense disease or discomfort that perhaps could be a divine invitation for you in, to investigate why you got here and what it would mean to possess the things that got you to this place so that they don't possess you? As we begin this journey and dream together and move forward in faith, living out of the best of what we have and who we are, individually and collectively, my hope, friends, is that we will learn uh, not to be the antithesis of what Paul speaks about, but to live more like he does, that we might learn to embrace what it is to be true and known and alive and persisting and rejoicing and making many whole as we possess all things. Amen. Amen. We get the gift of responding in this time, and it is World Communion Sunday, a uh, chance for us to, re to remember that um, we live in God's abundance, and that all we have is gift, and that we are united, we're connected with one another, not because we look alike, or we think alike, or even we vote alike, we're connected because of God's grace revealed in Jesus Christ. Uh, and that is a gift, and that's what we can remember today. Uh, last week, we had so much fun with a responsive liturgy uh, that I wanted to do it again this week. Uh, so you will have parts. We don't often do it at 9 a.m., but you will have parts um, to say uh, as we all participate in this connection by God's grace at this table together. So let's pray. God, we gather at the table. We come from many places differing in age, in race, differing in gender and sexuality, politics, and even religion. We gather not just at this physical table here and now, but we gather, God, with ancestors and angels and people of every nationality and culture and language, starting with one Middle Eastern Jewish table 2,000 years ago. This is a table with indigenous peoples, with Asian and African and Latin American and European peoples, as we come together around the table, we discover that our differences are not something we tolerate, but that our differences are indeed a blessing. The more difference we bring, the more fully we experience the presence of the sacred in our midst. So come, children of God, just as you are. Wherever you are on this journey of life, you're welcome here at this table, in this place, in this community. Come, children of God, come and let's remember together. We remember the stories that Jesus' friends told, stories of bread broken and shared, feeding a multitude, stories of being gathered together, enemy and friend around a table, stories of unlikely guests who reveal the face of the sacred. And they say that it was on a night of both celebration and betrayal that Jesus took the bread on the table, blessed it, and broke it, Reminding them that it is in the breaking that somehow we become whole. It's in losing our lives that we find them. It's in serving that we ourselves are served. As the grain scattered becomes one in the loaf, when we eat this bread, we become one with one another. They say that Jesus took the cup, poured out, and sharing. He remembered with his disciples the life-giving breath. Even now, 
pounding a rhythm through our veins, the breath of life from whence we come, the breath that precedes and follows all that we can see. As the grapes find life in the vine, when we drink this cup, we become at one with the source of life itself. And so we pray, come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless the fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking that our eyes might be open, that we might recognize the risen Christ in our midst, indeed in one another. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And abide with us, God, as we pray the family prayer that our older brother Jesus taught us, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. As we all are connected by God's grace at this table, it's really important that we say each week that all are welcome at this table. All can be recipients of God's grace here. Uh, And so um, when we say all, all means all. And uh, glad glad to have our kids come back to be a part of this. Um, we, We get to connect with God and one another in this time. So you'll uh, extend your hands to be given a gift, uh, a gift of a morsel of bread in in your hand, and you can dip it in the cup, or we'll have a gluten-free option in the back. You can also light a candle at the table in the back or up here uh, at this time to offer up a prayer, uh, to offer up a place of connection, to offer up a place of division that needs God's connection and grace uh, for reconciliation and redemption. As I often do, but every song must stand, but you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, because all that I have is a Nothing else fit 
for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah I throw up my hands praise you again and again so that I have is a high Except for a heart singing hallelujah, All right, y'all, let's stand and sing our final song. <laughs> I'm getting better at reading the cues, hopefully. <laughs> uh, gratitude. <laughs> I love this song. Uh, it's all about gratitude. Let's lift it up. Your car. 
never stop. No, nothing can stop my praise. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I'll never stop. No, I'll never stop. No, nothing can stop my praise. I will rejoice. Amen. Friend, as you go from this place, make sure you grab one of these. You can uh, put it on your fridge or invite a neighbor to our trunk or treat. Uh, Paul ends this part of his letter by saying, open your hearts to Christ. May it be so for each one of us as we go from this place to take stock of that which we have, uh, that which we might possess, the stories on which we might build, and how it is that God is moving us forward in faith. Go in grace and go in peace. Amen.